Good morning, good morning, good morning to all of you who have tuned in to Cathedral of Faith Ministry Virtual Sunday School. I'm Ella Charles now Sr. I'm a social minister here at Cathedral of Faith Ministry, where my pastor is Pastor Christopher Ella Martin Sr. And working right by his side is uh, First Lady Felicia Lynette Martin. And with that, uh, we have a beautiful lesson this morning to share with you. Um, and as we go forth in our lesson, we... We ask you again to get you some pens and pencils and paper. We have some good notes and facts we want to share with you this morning concerning this lesson. So we're going to get right into our lesson. We're going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to get right into the discussion of our lesson. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you for all things you've done for us, Lord, how you woke us up this morning, clothed in our right mind, the activities of our limbs. Lord, we thank you for how you rebuked death and you kept sickness off our body. Now, Lord, as we come to speak a word to thy people, we pray, God, that you word our mouth. Give us what to say and how to say it. Not that flesh may glory, but you get the glory out of everything we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The subject of today's lesson is praise with music. Praise with music. And the lesson scriptures is Exodus, the 15th chapter, 11 through the 21st verse. That's Exodus, the 15th chapter, the 11th through the 21st verse. And we're going to start reading our lesson this morning. Verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders, Thou stretchest out thy right hand, and the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestinia. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. And the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thy arm, thou shalt be here still as a stone. Still thy people pass over. O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. Thou hast shall bring them in, and plant them in the mountain of thy inheritance in the place. O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, the sanctuary, in the sanctuary. O Lord, which thy hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with the chariots and with the horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Mary and the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out for after her with timbrels and with dancing. And Mary answered them, Sing ye to the Lord. For he had triumphantly glorious the horse and his rider had thrown into the sea. Praise with music. As we examine our lesson this morning, there are five major features that characterize the book of Exodus. Number one, it records the historical circumstances of Israel's birth as a nation. Number two, it contains in the Ten Commandments God's summary of his moral law and righteous requirement for his people and thus provides a foundation for biblical ethics and morals in subsequent, subsequent revelation. And number three, it is the foremost Old Testament book describing the nature of God's redemptive grace and power in action. In Old Testament terms, Exodus describes the supernatural character of God's deliverance of his people from the peril and bondage of sin and Satan and the world. The entire book is spread throughout with a dignified revelation of God as a glorious and truthful, merciful, faithful, holy, and omnipotent sovereign God. He is a sovereign Lord over history and ruler of nations. And he is a redeemer who enters into the covenant with the redeemed, who is worthy of the devout worship and as the transcendent God who descends to tabernacle with his people. Mm -hmm. Exodus emphasized the how, what, and why 
of the true worship that should necessarily follow God's redemption of his people. And throughout Exodus, um, there is a foreshadowing of the redemption that is offered under the new under the new covenant. The first Passover, the Red Sea crossing, and the giving of the law at Mount Sinai are to the old covenant with Jesus Christ's death, resurrection, and giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost are to the new covenant. A variety in the book of Exodus that in indicates Christ and redemption in the New Testament are uh, Moses, the Passover, the Red Sea crossing, manna, the rock and water, and the tabernacle and the high priest. The, absolutely, the absolute moral demands of the Ten Commandments repeated in the New Testament is requirement for new covenant believers. As a prelude to our lesson this morning, we find that Israel, O oh God of praise, he is this point, he is at this point demanding that they praise him with music. And the reason being, God had delivered them from the bondage of Egypt from the hands of a murderous and ruthless tyrant named Pharaoh Ramses II. For you see, because of a famine in the land, Israel had to seek refuge in the land of Egypt by way of Joseph. And while in Egypt, Pharaoh became intimidated by the sure number of the Hebrews in his kingdom and ordered them all to be enslaved. They were at his mercy because he was feeding them. He provided shelter for them. And for 400 years, Israel endured bitter hardship and one time including a decree from Pharaoh that all male Hebrew children should be drowned at birth. He was intimidated. He was so insecure about his position and his authority that he didn't want to see anybody that might, might have the potential of coming in and, and, and defeating him and, and taking him out of, out of office. Mm -hmm. Because he believed that one day he thought that these Hebrews uh -huh, might rise up against me one day. Well, when you treat people like that, and when you enslave people like that, what you expect? Sooner or later, somebody, somewhere down the line, somebody going to retaliate because he believed, yes, that they were, they were going to go come against him. So Moses was chosen by his God, the only true God, to lead the Israelite people to freedom. And with his brother Aaron, Moses asked the Pharaoh one day to let the people of Israel leave Egypt in order to celebrate a feast in the wilderness to give honor to their God. And guess what? Pharaoh refused. Uh-uh. No, y'all not going anywhere. And at that point, God promised Moses that he would demonstrate the power to convince Pharaoh of, his, of their freedom. But at the same time, he would be convincing the Hebrews to follow his path. And first, God will harden their heart of the Pharaoh making him adamantly against the Hebrews leaving Egypt. Egypt. Now, God would harden Pharaoh's heart. And so he would adamantly refuse to let Israel leave Egypt. Now, you wonder why. Why would God automatically harden a man's heart? God intentionally hardened Pharaoh's heart because he had to send the plagues on Egypt to show both the Egyptian and the Israelite that he is one true God. They needed to know the truth about who really created them and how to best live their lives. I wonder today, with all the things that are going on in our world now, with the economy, with the flood, with the, with the pandemic, and, and everything that's going on, and the tornadoes, and the turmoil, and the, the murderers, and the crime, everything that's going on in the world right now seems like People hard are getting more hardened. Seem like they don't see what God is doing. Pharaoh, along with Egypt, worship idol gods, and that form of worshiping had influenced some of the Israelites as well. We found that out when they went out there and after they left Egypt, and they went out and bought and what? Had them a golden calf built. That idea, mentality came from Egypt. And so God sent nine plagues upon Egypt to try and get Pharaoh attention to free Israel, yet, yet they refused. 
However, it was the tenth plague that changed his mind. In the eleventh chapter of Exodus, verses four through five, God told Moses, About the midnight will I go out in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even until the firstborn of the maid servant that is behind the meal, and all the firstborn of beasts. Well, you know, when you all watch the Ten Commandments, and when I think about it, in that movie, which is a whole lot of fiction in it, fiction in it, but it's entertaining, but it's a lot of fiction in it. It says that Pharaoh was the one that sent the decree out that all the firstborn of the maid servant that is behind the meal and all the firstborn of, of the beast and all the firstborn of Israel, um, be the, the, uh, that be uh, that be dead, you know that he could that he he would kill them, uh huh. But God told Moses to instruct all of Israel to take an unblemished lamb and take of his blood and put it around the doorposts of all their dwellings. So when he sent the plague upon Egypt, their firstborn would be protected and their beasts would be protected, and the death angel would pass over their dwellings. By God killing every Egyptian firstborn was a terrible blow to the Egyptian because the firstborn normally carried on the family's hopes and ambitions. And God's judgment was his just recompense because of the Egyptian wickedness. Wonder why what God is doing now is so much wickedness in the land. And I do believe somebody is not going to believe this and not don't want to hear me, but I believe the judgment is in the land now. In the land that we live in, as I speak, their cruelty to the Hebrews and the drowning of the male babies were in themselves a persecution of God's first bomb. Mm -hmm. That he ordered back then, earlier, he just reaping what he sowed. The Egyptians were actually reaping what they had sowed because Pharaoh had ordered earlier that the Hebrews firstborn children be drowned. As I look at the heart of Pharaoh's heart, I liken it, as I said earlier, to the heart of many men and women's hearts today. Hebrews 3 and 15 says, a portion of this, a portion of this passage of Scripture say, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. Israel's heart got hardened while they were in, in the wilderness. And God let them wander in the wilderness for 40, what, years. And some of them died in the wilderness. Am I right or wrong? Some of them died in the wilderness. And he only allowed a certain generation to come forth. Same way it is now. People hard or hard. Right in church, people hard or hard. They can hear the word. Hear it preached. Knowing to be true, but yet won't respond to it. Notice in this scripture, it gives the hearer an option he or she can choose to entertain. What's being spoken unto them or ignore it. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? He gives you an option to entertain what's being spoken to you and respond to it or ignore it. Ignoring a disregarding word only brings wrath upon the one that is rebellion. And you can eventually be abandoned by God and his word and the word will have no influence in your life. The altar come, becomes an afterthought. Uh-huh, you see the now. You call it, make an altar call. Very few come to the altar. Hardly any, sometimes, never move. When that happens, you will become self-righteous and still a want a relationship, you will settle for religion. We got a lot of religious people now. No relationship, but just religion. Because relationship requires commitment. Relationship requires obedience. And then after a while, you will soon give up on that. But I shouldn't be alarmed because 2 Timothy, the third chapter, first through the seventh verse, tells us, this know also that in the last days perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of them own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truth breaker, false accuser, incontinent. That means lack of restraint. There is no restraint now. There is no shame now. People are letting it all go now. And fear is despisal if, uh, of those that are good. Yes. They despise people now. People despise you now because you come trying to compel them to live holy. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. 
having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. A lot of people just like they were in the biblical, biblical days when they were following Jesus. A lot of them was following Jesus for the fish and low. And then when he tried to doctrine them, they turned around and walked with him no more. Every act of sin mentioned in the passive scripture is prevalent in the world today. And as God sent plagues upon Egypt because of their rebellion and sin, I do believe he's sending plagues upon this nation because of his sin. The church got to get in order. Oh, my, oh, I better leave that alone. We're getting ready to get in some good trouble. But the church got to get in order. Just as he took nature to punish Pharaoh in Egypt, he is taking nature right now to punish America. America in his sin. God is tired of America's sin. I know many out there is not going to receive nor agree with what I just said. But we one must understand God along with Jesus and the Holy Ghost created the earth and the universe and everything in it. And God had specific reason for creating the world. Number one, God created the heavens and the earth as a manifestation of his glory, wisdom, and power. And number two, God created the heavens and the earth in order to receive back the glory and honor due to him. All the elements of nature, the sun and the moon, the trees or the forest, the rain and the snow, the rivers and the lakes and the streams, hills and mountains, the animals and the birds, shout out praise to God who made them. He equipped all of them with a, a unique ability to give him praise. How much more God desires and expects us to receive, uh, to receive glory and honor and praise from us as human beings. Dare us to come before the presence of God and not give him praise. When you can hear the birds chirping every day, the dogs are barking, giving God praise. God created earth in order to provide a place where his purpose and goals for human mankind might be fulfilled. When it came to the creation of the elements of nature, the universe, it was perfect. And everything in it was in harmony. The animals were created. When they were created, they were harmless. A matter of fact, all the creatures were harmless. The bear didn't have no growl. The lion didn't have no roar. He didn't need a roar to show off his stature. His roar is a defense element for him. Whether you know it or not, along with his fierce, fierce ability to attack and mangle anything in his sight. Uh-huh. They didn't have that. It didn't have that demeanor. Neither did the bear. The bee didn't have no sting. Uh-uh. The bee didn't have its sting. Even the snake didn't have its venom. Uh-huh. No venom that was poison enough to kill you. The mushroom didn't have its poison. No. Oh. The dog didn't even have its bark. I could go on and on and on, but I think you get the message. Because when I... Oh, my God. God has a... You, Amazing what God can do. It's amazing what God can do. Because I, mean, I think about Noah when he was gathering together all those animals and, and putting them in the ark and the lions and everything, female and male. He had to have the authority over them. God has given him a unique authority over him. Otherwise, they would have attacked him. But when it came to creating man, he designed humankind as a triune being. Body, soul, and spirit, like I explained to you last week. Possessing mind, possessing motion and will, uh -huh, which, which they can respond to him freely, which, which was equip man to respond to him freely with worship and praise and serve him as Lord of faith, loyalty, and gratitude. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get an attitude of gratitude, but the wrong attitude. Uh -huh. Genesis, the first chapter in the 27th verse. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. He, him. Male and female was created. He, them. Male and female. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve. Not Adam and Steve. Y'all hear that all the time. They both were created holy without sin, but yet with free will. Uh, Adam, yes, he created them Eve. <laughs> yes, not Eve and Yvette, but Eve, Adam and Eve. Uh -huh. This passage of scripture clarified the gender of humanity. Nobody was born a homosexual. I want to, I want to put that out there. Nobody was born a homosexual. I just told you, he created them male and female. Nobody was born, was born a lesbian, nor, 
transvestite, uh, uh, drag queen. Uh -huh. Nobody was born in that. God does not set nobody up to go to hell. He don't create a person to come in the world and doom them to hell. Oh, my God. Come on, y'all. God created Adam and Eve in his own image so that he could have with them a loving personal relationship for all eternity. He also gave Adam the ability to name all the animals that were created and have dominion over them. Adam looked at the monkey and said, come here, come here, your name monkey. He looked at the elephant. Come here, big fella, your name is elephant. He looked at the little insect. He looked at the mosquito. Oh, come here, your name mosquito. He, na he named everything. And God said, let us make man in our image after a likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth. And they're all every creeping thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. And the scripture says in Genesis 1 and 31, and God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was good. It wasn't corrupt like it is today. It was good. Matter of fact, Adam could go swimming with the, with the shark and, and pat him on the back. Matter of fact, get on his back and ride him, and didn't have to worry about being attacked by him. In Genesis 2 and 19, he said, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. And brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever called, Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Verse 20 said, Adam gave the names to the cows and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. Now that explains why all you, you be subject, uh, all of them were subject to him. Because he named them. And God created the perfect environment in which Adam and Eve were supposed to live and be fruitful and multiply and give him praise. And was called the Garden of Eden. And he told Adam in Genesis, the second chapter, 16 verse, of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. In verse 17, of the tree of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt but surely die. I gave you everything. Everything. Now, you know, as I think about it, let me jump back. As you see the animals today, they are meat eaters. They are meat eaters. You got meat eaters out there. Lions love meat. Bears love meat. They're meat eaters, and they attack other animals to satisfy their appetite. But back then, they didn't have that appetite. They didn't have that type. So what they were, what did they eat? Everything back then had to be a vegetarian. Ha, ha, ha. Everything back then, even the animals. Come here, elephant. You're going to eat some grass today. Uh-huh. They had to be. Otherwise, there were, they, they would have been attacking each other. Now there comes along this crafty serpent and attacked God through his creation. For he told Adam and Eve what God had said to Adam was not true. And they both believed him. And they both violated God's command and ate off the tree that was forbidden. And as a result, Adam and Eve sinned. I got to hurry through this. The curse of the sin and its consequences did come upon God's creation, including the human race whom God had made in his image. And one of the basic sins of human mankind today is unbelief. Same way it was back then. Unbelief in God's word. Believing that God somehow, God doesn't really mean what he says about salvation. Some people have got to walk around with an attitude like that now. It's like they got time on their hand. Missing all these opportunities to go to the altar to repent and get your soul right. As the day approaching. Uh -huh. but, you get, but you must have the mindset that you don't believe God meant what he says. Some people don't believe it about salvation, righteousness, sin, judgment, and death. Adam and Eve impact all aspects of God's creation. Their sin, Adam and Eve's sin, impact that all aspects of God's creation. After they killed, after they sinned, what the bear started growling, mm -hmm. the lion started roaring, the dog started biting, the shark started biting. The weather was no longer calm. Then. Other animals start attacking other animals. Even today, man has contaminated every aspect of God's creation. He has tampered with God's image by trying to confuse the gender of mankind, which God said is an abomination. Satan right now, he knows, he knows, he knows, he knows if his time is running out. And he has tackled everything he's kid. He's got into science. He's got into the medical field. He's got into every aspect of what we call uh, the norm around here, what we engage in, and what we, what we uh, live in. And he has attacked everything around here. Uh -huh. And now he's trying to change the image of God. 
He's trying to tell God, I can change your image. I can make a man think he's a woman. And I can make a woman think he's a man. Think she is a man. Ain't that something? He's trying his best to change the image of God. Mm, and which is abomination. He has cloned the animal kingdom and tampered with his genetics by crossbreeding them. He desires for man to return back to his first state. But God desired man to return back to his first state and had an implement relationship with him to praise him. Uh huh. And to restore between him and mankind that was established at creation, at creation called man was created holy. And he's the only creature that God has allowed and gave the opportunity, the ability to return back to his first state. Because when the animals die, they are done. They don't have a soul. Mm -hmm. They don't have a spirit. They, have the, they don't have a soul like we got. See what I'm talking about? They got a body, <laughs> but they are not triune. They are not impartite. Tripartite, excuse me. They are not tripartite. And our lesson today, after the children of Israel witnessed God destroying all of Pharaoh and the army in the Red Sea, Moses started singing a song. And he got all the men to chime in it. And then he gave his song to his sister Mary, and she assembled the women together. And some got some tamarines, and they started having church. <laughs> what better way to show God how appreciated you are for his goodness and mercy than through music? In the 150 divisions of song, they say, praise God in his sanctuary. Not only in his sanctuary, but we are to praise him when we are on our job, when we're driving in our car, uh, in the privacy of our homes, and in the mall, wherever we may be. I don't know how you can think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you. How could, oh, how could, oh, my God, when you think about what he's done for you, that ought to be enough to put a praise on your lips. Then in this same division of Psalm, there was a list of instruments we are to praise God with. You can read that in the 150 divisions of Psalm. The mere fact that God has done in creation and redemption in our personal lives ought to make us want to praise him. The matter of fact, the fact that if you say you saved and you 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 supposed to be saved like you spoke like the Bible said and you really say you saved and you are saved, then that within itself, as a Gentile that was alienated from God, and because Jews rejected him, he sent what he sent his minister in the way of the Gentile. That's why we were grafted in. We're not Jews by nature, but we are Jews by His Spirit. Uh huh. We're John Earls with Christ. Uh -huh. Oh, I tell my son all the time. I wish I could play some type of instrument. Oh my God! I guarantee you, I would play the devil out of somebody. Oh, glory! Oh my God! I wish I could play some. I'd play the devil out of somebody, and you wouldn't have to pay me either. You wouldn't have to pay me. You wouldn't even have to pay me. Somebody ain't gonna like this, but I'm going to say it anyhow. I was reared in the old church, where the musician had the Holy Ghost. And their hands had an anointing in them. And a lot of them didn't get paid for playing. And from the organist, to the piano player, to the guitar player, to the drummer, to the tambourine player, or whatever, they would have to take their gift and play until the Holy Ghost would come upon them and make a difference in the service. Nowadays, you have musicians, somebody gonna get mad at me. They got talent, but no anointing. And they play in their talent, not under the anointing. And you notice that they, they, they try to come up with these different, well, let me leave it alone. But they play in talent. And some of them just left the club the night before, smelling like weed and alcohol and playing. And they come in and jump on somebody's instrument. And then they send up strange fire to God, only to get paid. And then there are others who just sweet as teeth. Uh, um, bent wrist, not from playing, but because they are confused about their sexuality, trying to be a woman when God made them a man, and vice versa. And they also get on somebody's instrument, sending up fire before, strange fire before the Lord. And we wonder now, and somebody ain't going to like this, and we wonder now and what God is doing right now in the land. And we wonder why he's allowing what he's allowing right now. Uh, I realize few of us would want to worship in a church where there was no music. But all through the Bible, when music was mentioned, it served as a purpose, not just for entertainment. In 1 Samuel, let me give you a couple of examples because my time is almost up. 
In 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, 23rd verse, when the devil got into Saul, the scriptures say David was so skilled with his heart, he had an anointing in his heart, and he would take his axe, and he'd play that devil off of Saul. And in 2 Kings, the third chapter, uh, Jehoram was king over Israel at the same time Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. Now the king of the motorbikes decided they, they would attack Israel. So Jehoram asked Jehoshaphat, mm -hmm, the king of Israel, to help them fight against the Moabites, and he agreed to do so. And along the way to the battle site, they went through Edom, and they had the king of Edom join them. He and king going to join them now. And somehow they got lost, and they was running out of water. And for the armies, and, the, and they're thirsty, and they're cattle too. So Jehoshaphat asked, was there a prophet nearby that might can help them in distress, in their distress? Because they was too weak to go to battle uh, from thirst. They was too weak to go to battle. So then one of the servants of Israel spoke up and said, there was a prophet by the name of Elijah that was not too far from him. So the three kings went to Elijah. <coughs> Excuse me. And as they approached Elijah, Elijah saw Jehoram with him. And he got so vexed and got so mad because he knew Jehoram's background. You see, Jehoram, Jehoram father was Ahab. And you know who Ahab was married to? Jezebel. And they worship an idol god called Baal. And Jehoram was an evil ruler also. But, he res but Elijah respected Jehoshaphat. He had his eyes on Jehoram, but he looked over there and saw Jehoshaphat. And he was trying to figure out, now, why is this fellow running with this fellow? Wait a minute. This don't make no sense. And it vexed him more. It vexed him more. See, something come that you ain't supposed to be in the midst, in the midst of. Because two can't walk together unless they agree. I'm a right or wrong. So some circles in a circle, you can't, you can't be hanging around and call yourself saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. So he told Jehoram, if Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat wasn't with you, I wouldn't give you the time of day. Because <laughs> I know your daddy and I know your mama. And the tree don't, you know, the apple don't fall far from the tree. And I know you. But I'm trying to figure out, now why is Jehoshaphat with you? But I know Jehoshaphat. There, there's got to be a reason. And he had respect for Jehoshaphat. But Elijah was so upset at the sight of Jehoram, yet horror, he needed something to clear his mind, clear his head. Because they came to him for to seek something from God to get him an answer where they can find water and shelter and whatever to meet their needs at the time they, so when they go to battle. <laughs> but uh, Elijah's head was messed up because he couldn't stand your hope. So he said, bring me a minister. Uh, he said, bring me a musician. That's what he said. Not just any musician, but one that can take his heart and help me seal off this outside distraction and this unbelief around me so I can hear from God. See, see what I'm talking about. See how powerful music is. And one that can restore me back to the frame of mind and the spirit so I can hear from. Woo, ha, ha, pray, play, bring me a minister, a musician that can pray this devil out of my mind. I want to pay, I want to ask the musicians out there today, when the last time have you prayed, played the devil out of somebody's mind? Oh, my brothers and sisters, music can be a powerful weapon when it's accompanied with the anointing, with the anointing. I know somebody getting upset with me right now, but that's okay. But guess what? I'm telling you right now, these gifts you got and the Lord give you to be musically uh, sound and be able to play. He's just not giving it to you, to especially you you doing it in the Lord's house. You know, some of them, some people play because play in the clubs and play and want to play in church at the same time. Mm-mm, mm-mm. That's what the Bible says, sweet water and bitter water can't come out of the same fountain. 
You can't go over here and serve the devil and then come over here and think you're going to serve the Lord. You just playing and, and, and it's talent. You just playing because of your talent. And you are, most of them nowadays, are, and I'm going to say this, a lot of them hirelings now. And they'll try to hold, hold churches hostage. If, if, you, if you don't give me this and you don't give me that, I ain't playing. I ain't playing. Mm -hmm. I'm not playing at all. And we'll sit there in your service and won't play. My God. But you better be careful. You be careful because God is looking, as they said, and booking. And you got to make sure that in the day to come, when you get to read to meet him, you're going to have to give account of everything done in your body down here. I want to tell you this morning, brothers and sisters, you need to praise God for everything he's doing for you. Praise him anyhow. I praise him every day. I let him know, God, I'm so thankful that you guarded me and you putting a hedge of protection around me, shielding me from all hurt, harm, and oh, glory. I give you the glory. I give you the honor. I give you the praise. Praise is my weapon. Don't you know you can praise your way out of debt? Praise your way into a healing? Praise your way into promotion? You can praise your praise. And guess what? Don't make it. When you're running around the church and you're doing this, and the, see, I'm going to say this, and I got to close. I got to get out of here. But I've never seen so many people have the same dance now in church. You know, in the old church, everybody had their own unique praise. They had their own unique dance. But it seemed like where well, these praises and shouting and dancing a lot of these folks got now, seemed like they done got together and, and, and rehearsed it or looked out there on social media and practiced it so much. They got them. I've never seen so many people dance, dance the same, same way in my life. God, in the old church, we all had our unique praise. We had our unique praise. But when your praise got a purpose, uh-huh, uh huh. Your anointing will be, <laughs> your anointing on you will be different, and your praise will be different. When you praise him in the flesh, then your flesh might be looking like somebody else. But when your praise get a purpose, and it's anointed behind it, guess what? It'll have its own uniqueness. With that, I'm gonna close. I gotta get out of here this morning. I thank God for all of you who who took time to share with us in our virtual Sunday school this morning. I hope and pray you enjoy that, that you enjoyed what you heard and hope you have gotten something out of it to help you with your spiritual life. And with that, we're going to compel you and uh, we're going to solicit that you like so a seed into our Sunday school ministry. Just a small seed of $5 to help us further the kingdom of God. You can do so by two ways. You can sow by uh, Cash App, that's dollar sign COF uh, Church, and you can sow by Givelify, that's Cathedral Faith Church, COF, Cathedral of Faith Church. With that, we're not going to consume any more time with words, but we also want to uh, uh, solicit that you join us in our 11 a.m. service and our morning worship service where you're going to hear a powerful word from God that minister the total man from our pastor this morning. The praise team will be, will be uh, worshiping and praising God in songs. And then if you can't catch us on in person, we got a little seat and we start at 11, so make sure you be here on time. Then if you can't join us in person, you can watch us also virtual at 11 o'clock at Cathedral Faith Church page. Please, please, and Pastor Martin page as well. So you can watch us in those venues and also COT, COF TV as well. You can watch us in those venues as well. Then if you can't make it at 11 a.m., you can also attend us at 5 p.m. Uh, there's also limited seating, uh, but uh, you can also watch us virtually as well. So please, 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 why don't you partner with us in our services today? And with that, we're going to let you go. I, I want you to continue to pray for me, and I'm going to continue to pray for you, and we're going to all watch God change things.